What's up, everybody? Hey. Welcome to episode two of Climbing the Ladder. I'm your host, Chain Man V, and co-hosting with me is John Clark, Chief Operating Op- Officer of CSN. What's up, John? Uh, not much. How are you? Good. And uh, we'll have Mr. Bitter here uh, stepping in in just a second. He's running a little bit late, but I figured we'd get started in the meantime. Uh, so big thanks to all you guys that watched the show last week. Uh, we got some great feedback, and... You know, it just makes me feel good, and uh, you know, just all of us it makes us feel good that you know, a lot of you guys are uh, enjoying the show, and it really resonates with you guys. So, hopefully, we'll continue doing some really great content that you'll uh, you know enjoy, and hopefully, makes an impact on you sports. But I want to welcome our two guests today. Uh, first off, we have Bryce E.G. Machine Bates. What's up, hey, Bryce? What's up? Not too much. Uh, Pleasure to be here. I'm sure a lot of you guys know him already. He's a pro gamer. And uh, I've actually had the pleasure of working with Bryce quite a bit in the, in the last year, so uh, yeah, we have. <laughs> it's been a great time, <laughs> great time on Pro Corner. And uh, the second guest we have is Tim Shindigs Young, Community Manager at TTE Sports. A lot of you guys probably know Shindigs from a lot of the interviews and videos he he uh, he made actually before you were on TTE, you know, TTE, right? So yeah. Uh, yeah, I interviewed Lindsay Sporer, and that was really popular. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't the other way around. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I saw her at the NASL season one finals, and I'm like, I need to get this, and I put it on TL, and they featured it in the final write-up for the season one finals, and I was like, pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. But uh, today, what we're gonna do is, uh, for those of you you know tuning in for the show for the first time, what we what we like to do here is we're gonna really dig into the. The show generally will dig into the player, team, tournament organizing, and sponsor segment. And uh, what we'll try to do is clear up some misconceptions, try to bring up some issues that that we feel you know need to be you know need to be solved, and and maybe some solutions that we might have for it. And um, and today, since we have Machine and Shindix on here, you know we'll be focusing a lot on the player and the sponsor sponsor uh, segments. So to start off the show, um, and, and this is how we c- we're going to start off all the shows, is uh, we're going to 
go through any misconceptions you guys think that um, the community has right now in any of the segments. But you know, obviously, you guys have an expertise in, in the player and the sponsor segments. So, yeah, I mean, any any misconceptions you guys think that that need to be cleared up, or you know, uh, that you think are really, really, really bad right now? <laughs> mm. I don't know. I kind of like Tim's idea that being a pro gamer is just extremely fun and like easygoing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of joking, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, it's honestly just a lot of work, really. Like we're not here, just you know, this isn't something we just kind of fell into. It takes a lot of work, especially at a game like this. You'll have a lot of players who spend in, uh, put in a ton of time, don't really end up accomplishing uh, a whole lot in the same uh, at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's just it's kind of a lot of work, really stressful. Uh, isn't it as uh, easy as you know a lot of people would think. I don't know. Cool. Yeah, I imagine. Always, you got to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll I imagine John it can first. be fun, though, right, Machine? Oh, it, it can be. It certainly started out as a hobby, as I'm <laughs> sure it did for everyone. But yeah, it's a little bit different when you get thrown to the limelight, I guess. Yeah, I would agree. I guess uh, a more broader uh, misconception is there is a lot more money in esports, or people perceive there's a lot more <clears throat> money in esports than uh, you know than people initially thought, and there's. There's really not a lot to go around, and also that um, it's all fun and games. I guess once you get some kind of job or pro gaming gig in esports, it it turns into uh, I I'm being a bit in a, in not eloquent right now, but I guess overall there's just everyone's still trying to figure it out. So there's kind of a lot of as much as structured as StarCraft II is. There's not a lot of structure to finding sponsors or to marketing for sponsors or anything like that. So there's actually a lot of work, like just experimenting figuring stuff out and you know the fun comes later but honestly it's a, it's more of like a big blob right now than than a lot of structure it's getting better but yeah. um, it's not that much it tends to be a lot of like luck based as well like fortunately yeah. for me, being on EG like, EG is very good about you know grabbing sponsors and putting in the effort and the time to do so but there's a lot less fortunate teams out there even teams like team liquid like, yeah I was, have, just, you know, I was just I was just going to ask that Tim when you're dealing with teams uh, Obviously, dealing with teams like EG that does have uh, a structure and a process at which they do things, um, it's probably much easier than dealing with teams that are just coming to you for the first time or reaching out to sponsors for the first time, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely takes some time for a team to figure out like um, how to go about a sponsorship, how to propose a sponsorship. You know, some teams come to me; they don't have a marketing deck or anything like that, and that's fine. You know, they can just show me their website, they can show me their stats. But maybe another misconception we can talk about is that. Uh, people think sponsors is just content with, you know, this This is like a really broad term, but exposure. Like, you know, they come up to you, it's like, hey, my team was going to get you a lot of exposure, or my event's going to get you a lot of <laughs> yeah. exposure. And it's like, what does that really mean, you know? It's like, oh, we'll plug you on Facebook and Twitter, and, you know, that's just really one small component of the bigger picture. And actually, a team like EG, you know, I had the privilege of going to the uh, Princeton esports panel that Alex Garfield sat on. Yeah. And, you know, the stuff he was talking about marketing, the stuff he sp talks about spending all that time talking to sponsors... No, it's it's all. It actually takes a lot of time, and I'm surprised more teams don't have like one dedicated sponsor guy or one dedicated marketing guy. Some guy who doesn't even touch the pro gamers. Some guys who doesn't even touch the tournament scheduling. Some guy who just um, really just thinks about what the sponsor needs and how to grab more sponsors. Because really, I think that's right. the point we we're at right now. Is we kind of recruited all the big stars. We recruited all the up and comers. Now we really need to think about how to really capitalize on um, all these sponsorship deals that are landing in people's laps. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. I mean I can't even speak um, like from personal experience with um, you know just me and you, Tim, obviously you know, talking yeah, recently yeah, yeah. about getting sponsorship for even my shows. Um, you know I think some people don't actually realize that you know you have to go and seek out these sponsors. I mean these sponsors just don't come to you just because you have you know even if I, even if you have like a popular show or if you have a you know just a big event. I mean. They're not just coming to you, right? I mean, you actually, like you said, you have to have somebody dedicated to actually going and seeking out sponsors and um, even maintaining, you know, right? You know, definitely maintaining whatever, you know, it's like professional services type of stuff, right? Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Very good. Point. A lot of a lot of these teams uh, in dealing with uh, with te with the teams that I have as an organizer, a lot of these teams do uh, occasionally they'll have somebody that they kind of put in charge of marketing, going out and getting sponsors. But you have to remember these guys are unpaid; they're volunteers, and they have you know full time jobs and and a full time life outside of that. So it is difficult, but and I think that goes to show that it requires a a ton of work 
to really be able to create relationships with different sponsors yep. and to make those things work. I mean, it it can't really be a part-time job or really you just end up being a part-time team. I mean, you really have to put full time into it. And, it. and it's difficult. I mean, this is the way esports has been for as long as I've been in it. It's, it's mostly volunteer work. It's it's tough to find that one volunteer that will really just go out of their way and like, make a <laughs> job. So right. I can understand the struggles that a lot of teams are having. Hey, Ben. What's up? Hey, guys. Sorry that I'm a little late. No problem. We're just talking about misconceptions right now. Started okay. out with that. And, uh, what, what is our misconception? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Everything. <laughs> it's all wrong. <laughs> all wrong. Yeah, well, Bryce started off with talking about just the misconception that, you know, pro gaming, more of a romanticized view of pro gaming and that, um, you know, pro ga being a pro gamer is a lot of work. And, uh, you know, a lot, I guess some people don't realize how much work, you know, just all the responsibilities he has on top of playing, too, right? And, you know, like eating cinnamon? <laughs> eating cinnamon. Yeah, right. <laughs> eating cinnamon, burgers, all, you know, like, oh, it's so rough. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no hey, gosh. But, uh, yeah, any other misconceptions you guys uh, want to talk about? Hmm. Or now we can just jump right in. Let's just jump right into some of these topics. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to start off by talking you know, to Bryce a little bit more about um, the player segment. Uh, one thing I want to start off with was, is given that you are you know, a member of t uh, Evil Geniuses, and Evil Geniuses is definitely on the top, you know, the top side of, of the team segment, like maybe, you know, the, the top rung of the, t the team segments. Um, kind of want to get get a sense of what you think are the benefits of being on, on the big team. I mean, some of them are obvious, but, you know, it'd be nice to, for you to actually explicitly kind of list some of those things out. Um, obviously, first off, uh, the exposure. I know we just, like, talked about exposure being, like, a really broad w word, but, like, just being, like, pooled in with players like an Idra, Puma, a huck has given me a ton of benefits. Uh, the uh, I don't know the ability to just get interview numbers just by being on a, a team EG. You know, people Google team EG, and every time you know they do something like that, my name uh, pops up. The, the ability to be able to cast events like MCSL. Uh, you know, er, every time someone watches a stream uh, that takes part at the EG house, you know, I'm, I'm also, like, mentioned in that, or people can see me, you know, just being able to ask, like, oh, who's that? Oh, it's EG Machine, you know. Um, <clears throat> EG is very good about uh, getting sponsors, as we said earlier, as we said earlier, so, you know, the benefit of having such great sponsors, uh, a nice salary, there, there's tons and tons of advantages I have just by being on such a, a big team like EG, so, yeah. <laughs> Would you say that um, you know a lot of those things that you mentioned were you know have a lot to do with with uh, you know being able to market yourself and you know promote yourself in the community? Um, yeah. You know, one thing I you know I have noticed and kind of wanted to ask you is, do you feel like uh, some of those things are hindrances for you to practice and become a better player, or do you do you think no? I mean, it's like time that I would have been spending doing nothing, so that that I'm you know you know, going and help promoting some of your sponsors and that kind of thing, but... Oh, definitely. Like, I have days where I have to get up in the morning, I go over to the, the what we call it, the EG studio at Scott's house, I spend the morning filming, you know, basically me, like, going over replays or something like that, and then that night I'll have to go ahead uh, and cast, like, an MCSL or something, and then I get home and we're doing a sponsored video for, you know, what, I don't know, say something like Intel, like maybe just talking about one of their motherboards or something. So that's a day just wasted. So I, I really don't well, get to practice. It's not a wasted day, day, Bryce. No, it's not a wasted you make, day. You make more money on that day than you do in a day of practice. Yeah, yeah, you, you're right there. But, uh, you know, as far as someone who takes the game very seriously, very competitively, and I'm, I'm looking to just go to, like, win tournaments, uh, it, you know, Having days where you're unable to practice or where most, most of your time is spent split up between you know, making videos and, and things for EG, it's obviously extremely beneficial to me and my name. It helps me market myself, but it's not helping me get better at the game, I guess. I'm not able to spend like the 12 to 16 hours a day that I'd, I'd like you know, just purely practicing. So, so I mean, that, that's, that brings up a good point. Like, so a mentality of a player today is like you know a lot of a lot of people I, I know a lot of viewers and a lot of fans you know um, one of the things that they they, uh, they I guess that you could say complain about sometimes is that you know our 
our U.S. players in particular are are marketing themselves more than they're you know actually practicing and trying to become better. So as a player, I kind of wanted to get your sense, like how, what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously there is this money making aspect of it. You have to like, you know, make a living out of it. But there's the side of you know trying to become the best player in the world too. So, um, like, you know, as you know, for yourself personally, like, mm -hmm. what do you feel about that right now? Like, what's the most important thing for you right now? Well, obviously, I got to pay the bills. You know, that mm -hmm. comes first and foremost. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I don't think I'd be the player I am right now if I wasn't marketed as well as you know I am. You know, doing these videos for EG, uh, you know, commercials, you know, things like that have obviously extremely benefited myself, so I don't really regret the decisions I've had to make. But, you know, at the same time, uh, I got into programming for a reason. You know, StarCraft II is a passion of mine. I'd really like to be a, uh, you know, a competitive player, someone who's up there with, like, the uh, Marine King Primes, the Dong Ray Goos. Uh, it's just it's not very feasible at the moment, I guess. You know, you got to look out for yourself first. And then uh, just kind of follow your, your passions later, I guess. Hey, what do you guys think that in South Korea, the, um, I guess pro gaming team houses like kind of have more of a, I guess more leeway in that sense because you know they're expected. The culture there breeds that kind of expectation that you should be practicing that much. Where in the, you know in North America or <laughs> elsewhere, you know it, everyone's still trying to figure it out. Like you know you have to keep pleasing your sponsors. You have to keep showing that it's worth it. While in South Korea, you know, they, they see how Brood War is, they see how all these big tournaments go, they know it's worth it, so, you know, they can have someone dedicated to work the sponsorship while they have the rest of the team practice. I mean, it just seems that the, the scene in the United States and North America just has to keep getting bigger in order to, like, give guys like you more time to practice. Yeah, uh, I agree, but at the same time, I oh, think no. it's what... No. No? No. I want to hear it. <laughs> I go. No, I'm going to get schooled. Here we go. I'm going to get schooled. All right. No, we talked about this last week, man. Uh, it's uh, in, in Korea, it's it's the accountability is where it needs to be. There's The teams are held to a standard by the coaches and the managers, where in North America, um, the players just do whatever the hell they want, <laughs> and the coaches and the managers... Well, there are no coaches, and the managers are pretty much solely going after sponsors there's nobody there's nobody cracking the whip on these guys um i feel like i'm going a little bit off topic it's not a culture yep. thing man esports <coughs> is pretty big in north america and in, in, and in europe uh and sponsors are interested in watching that's why intel is dumping millions yeah. of dollars into yeah. esports in europe that's why and well i guess i should say around the world and that's why you've got all these big companies like tt esports and and razor and and everybody else that's that's investing, but it's just they're trying to figure out where to put that money, and 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 that's my opinion. Well, I mean, then, then there's a benefit to having someone dedicated on the t like. Not all teams have this, but there there's got to be someone dedicated on the team who handles sponsorships, so everyone mm. else can focus on the no, programming. That's the wrong thing to focus on. Uh, a sponsor is not going to just invest money to somebody that's like, hey, I've got a team, give me some money. That's that's stupid. Sponsors yeah, yeah. are looking for somebody that is that is creating results, and that's who they're going to invest in. Sponsors are looking for people like uh, Alex Garfield, who is promoting his players and building a brand, versus uh, creating uh, versus just being like, hey, I've got players, give me some money. Um, the the focus of these managers and and these people that are trying to start these teams should be on creating the right creating that right culture that's the word that you use that, that atmosphere inside the house that says hey your fucking job is to get good at starcraft and and until you do that you know i can't i can't be expected to bring you big money sponsors <coughs> because they're not going to invest in mediocrity or they shouldn't yeah i mean to you know i, I think to tim's point i think you know both of you guys are i kind of had a or i kind of agree with both of y'all but I, I think tim I think Tim's right that he, you do need somebody dedicated to, spon to getting sponsors. But I think, Ben, what you're trying to get at is that there needs to be more, you know, management needs to, there needs to be more management focused on just getting the players better, right? And I don't think that, that that's happening right now. No, you can't, you can't go to a sponsor and ask for a handout without showing them something. You have to have a sustainable model that you can approach them with. Otherwise, they're going to be like, sure, here's some keyboards. And you're going to be like, well, gee, this isn't exactly what I wanted. And they're like, well, gee, this isn't exactly what we wanted either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very true. So, Bryce, like, Very true. so with, with EG, I mean, pertaining to this, um, 
would you say that there is enough kind of daily management of you players at the house um, from uh, a coaching and from a just even purely a scheduling standpoint? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, I, as uh, Ben was saying, yeah. Biggest, uh, most successful not really, team in North America. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, we're, we're not really kind of pressured into practicing. It's kind of just like on our own time and so forth. But, you know, as far as like cracking the whip on, you know, sponsor videos and things like that, yes, we definitely do. Like we try to, uh, I don't know, get as much out of our players as possible as far as marketability, but uh, there's not really a, a huge focus on practicing. It's but you had that foundation up. prior to being where you were. You had these players who had enjoyed success in IDRA and these players who had enjoyed big community exposure and in control, people that, that StarCraft too that the, that the foreign scene is built around. So that is what, that's what attracts those big sponsors. That's how you guys got Intel and Monster and everybody else to come hop on board. And, uh, and, and from that foundation, now you can move forward somewhere. All these other small teams that are trying to start up and, and do whatever, they don't have that backing. So they have, to, they have to create that result before they can really expect to get anything out of a sponsorship. Okay, uh, uh, ben, do you think they can create a... Um, not necessarily a result, but do you think they can create something that's marketable, like a person or a... Uh, for example, Scarlett. I mean, yes, uh, she's definitely got results. But do you think she doesn't that a have team she doesn't have results, John? Well, she's I mean, results won a couple in one games right, in one tournament. Right. So what I'm saying is, is it possible for teams to go the other route where they're creating uh, just simply marketability? It has nothing to do with results. Is that possible for uh, for teams to do? It's possible for a couple of people in the community. It's it, although it's not possible for. 99.9% .9 of organizations. Okay. It's possible for people that can pick up uh, an in control. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody that's comparable to Jeff, and I, I just I can't. Destiny. Um, Destiny. Des mm, that's no. I wouldn't make that comparison. That's a different can of worms. And Destiny s practices really hard, to be mm -hmm. completely fair. Mm -hmm. um, what about? Hmm. What about a guy like Maximus Black, who gets who like? Who is Maximus Black? I mean, I, the, I would never pay do you, for him. Do you even know I who he know is? I mean, he, the no. guy gets over a thousand viewers, every, and he's not even featured whenever he streams. That's that's a completely different uh, community. Well, if we're mm -hmm. solely talking competitive communities, then yeah, like obviously no one knows who he is. But right. like this, it's, this is a whole different culture of these YouTube guys who just have these big wild personalities. Um, even in like Call of Duty, they do these frag videos. Maximus Black does those cheese fails videos. Like it's just caters to the casual, not even StarCraft community, but just the casual gaming communities. And I think that's just a different can of worms right. kind of thing. But getting back on just you know small teams having to to re produce results, you know define what are results because there are only wins. like a handful wins. of wins. There's one definition. I mean, wins, but there are only a handful of players that can win tournaments. I mean like. Like no, how many there's only do we a handful actually? of players that work yeah. hard enough to win tournaments. That's a good point. Oh, well, there are, but I'm just saying, like, there. I mean, okay, let's say we just let's say we just laid out all the big tournaments we have for the year. I mean, that's the number that we have there. I mean, that, that's not gonna that's not gonna even be the same number as like the, all the teams we have, right? So not every team can, even if they wanted to, right? Even if they wanted to produce players, um, they're not gonna be able to to win these big tournaments. Why? But, because there's just not enough tournaments. Well, what I mean, <laughs> it's I kind guess, of what I'm, there's countless why does it have to? Why does it have to be? Uh, why does it have to be the big tournaments all the time? I think that's yes, exactly a problem no, too. Yeah, true. It doesn't necessarily have to be all of the big tournaments. I mean, that's just one that the eyes are on, mm -hmm. but that might be part of the problem is that there's not enough eyes on some of these tournaments in which, uh, you know. I mean, play him daily will end up, you know, at least when you get towards the later rounds, they'll have 16 very solid players in there, and probably 15 of which no one's ever heard of. And if they don't win that, they're, I mean, then they're still not getting eyes on him. I mean, they're not getting much eyes on him anyway, but, but uh, they need to win those things too. I mean, th those are results just as much as the big tournaments. They're huge results. Violet won how many play hims in a row before Empire picked him up? 40? Quite Forty, yeah. <laughs> and then he ran all the ones that we ran, which were the the rundowns, and we would have eight players that we thought were a pretty good skill. But okay. if you still can't get past that hump of beating uh, of beating Violet, for instance, we bring Violet in to the rundown, which is just eight, just eight people, 
And if you can't get past Violet, um, you know, or you can't get past the first round, I mean, what is that? I mean, you're not getting the results. Those are still results, too. If, if someone was to beat Violet in the rundown or in the finals of Flayham, that's a pretty significant result. And yeah, it, those, those sort of things need to be seen more, I think. Okay. Well, uh, I think those are... No, all. I don't agree. It doesn't need to be seen. It needs to be sought by teams. Okay, I agree with that. I understand what you're saying. Maybe we talked maybe. about that a little bit last week too. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I had something when I was dumb. So. But uh, okay, so getting back, I think we got a little bit on a tangent there. But getting back on the you know player segment again, Bryce, kind of wanted to ask you too. Um, sure. You know, given that you're living in a team house, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what every team strides for, like at least uh, any North American team right now, is yeah. to have a team house, right? Yes. Um, why don't you talk about the pros and cons of being in a team house? Um, let's see, the, the pros of it, obviously, being able to, <laughs> to interact with other players, like, you know, just like last night, uh, for example, I was able to go ahead and sit down with uh, Greg and just talk about a, a particular matchup. I wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't living in, uh, you know, a team house or at least in a house with someone. Being able to uh, have someone kind of critique your play in person is a lot different than having someone try to like observe your game and like see what you're doing wrong. You're able to catch a lot more mistakes that way, so uh, I, I can see benefits from that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, just marketability, once again, being able to, to all stream from the same house, uh, it, it really gets us known. Uh, being able to make videos, the so biggest, a lot. the biggest pro fee, Bryce, is the lack of overhead. You can sit there and focus on StarCraft with 100% of your time and energy, and that's what players need to reach new levels. Uh, the marketability and all that stuff is is very substantial too, because it gives you a brand that you can carry past being a programmer. But the biggest thing for you right now is being able to sit there and, and have a life that revolves around StarCraft without having to worry about paying your mortgage or your car insurance or you know what you're going to eat in the morning. Well, kind of do that anyway. But still got car insurance, buddy. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> that that car insurance bill, what is that? Fifty bucks a month, yeah. bro. <laughs> oh, not when you've got as many speeding tickets as I have, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should just invest in a Segway. <laughs> so, yeah, and a bike. Uh, yeah. wise. Exactly. Oh, why don't you talk about some of the cons of being in a house? Um, honestly, there there really isn't much. <laughs> being able to purely focus on the house, I, I live with. I guess living with some of your best friends can be distracting at times. You know, you you, you eventually want to go out and just like have a good time with them, hang out sometimes, uh, spend the time just kind of chit chatting. Uh, but really, there's there's not a whole a whole lot of cons from here. Uh, just I don't know distractions with animals. I've never lived with animals before. That's, that's a little <laughs> uh, but no, there's there's not a whole lot of cons to to what I'm doing right now. I mean, you had mentioned earlier though in the conversation that you wanted to have the opportunity to to practice 12 to 16 hours a day or whatever. And, yeah. Um, so those distractions could seriously be, uh, I mean, they could be a huge con to really what yeah. you want to do as a player, yeah, and probably not fault, man. That's no, it's man not. It, it, it's not, and I agree with what you were saying, and I think that's why I was bringing that up is because what you were saying earlier is that there definitely needs to be a lot more direction. I mean, it's almost like it, it is a job. I mean, if I'm if I'm sitting yeah, at right, if I'm sitting in a in an office, you know, a bunch of cubicles, you know, like but what Ben's, you know, he's in his office right now, and if he's just oh. playing. League of Legends all day, and his job is to do something else, and and his manager, and we brought this up last week, his manager doesn't get on him for doing that. Hey, uh, more power to Ben for getting away with being able to play League of Legends all day, but his manager should have been on him the whole time. I mean, yeah. should have should have came up to him and said, knocked, you know, tapped on his shoulder and said, hey, you know, this isn't acceptable here. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, and it's it's something we're actually focusing on. We're starting to get like a training regiment going and things, so it's it's not like it's gone unnoticed. But you're absolutely correct. But at the same time, like before, I actually lived in the EG house. I'd say I, I played a lot more, like especially even in Brood War when I wasn't even being paid. I was probably playing tw- close to at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week for years. So there's a lot of uh, you know it, things that. Uh, advantages to just living by yourself. Yeah, and your and your more relaxed practice schedule regimen is 
reflective in your results, Bryce. You were much more successful in Brood War. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's a catch-22 because you do have to please sponsors, and you know, EG has a certain uh, brand that they're trying to sell. And like you said before, I mean, you have to you doing these videos and things. So it is a catch-22 because your exposure might be greater. But I think what Ben was trying to say is that. You know, sometimes the results, I mean, the results at the end of the day are what could get you the most exposure. Yeah. You know, yeah, you're absolutely right. Every time, like, you know, Chris makes a top four in an MLG, that's it's so much more exposure than right. you know, anything else. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it doesn't matter how many videos he did or how many Twitter followers he had or how many yeah. T-shirts he, he gave out so or autographs. It matters that he's ranked one on Reddit for four days. Yeah. Yeah, so. exactly. So with, with a lot of these, you know, things that I guess we kind of view as you know, obligations that you have, things like, you know, having to cast the Master Cup, you know, Master Cup series and that kind of thing. Um, how much of those things are, comp like, actually required of you versus you actually choosing and, you know, you being compensated for it? Uh, they're all required, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Anything else, guys, around this topic? All right, let's move on then. <laughs> All right, why don't we get into this a little bit of the sponsor topic with uh, Tim here? Um, you know, for you being you know the TT sponsor and, and the guy who goes out there and is trying to look for more content and more things to sponsor, uh, what are the, some of the things that you look for when it comes to events, teams, shows, you know, things like that? Um, personally, this, this is kind of my own preference at this, but I like to scout out kind of smaller community projects from time to time. Like, not all the time, but from time to time that I feel like have a lot of potential and just try to work with those people in the long term. I look for, um, on a much bigger picture, I work. I look for people who are thinking long term, like who are looking to do a long term partnership because as a sponsor to work with someone who's just trying to grab like 50 different sponsors to make their event look legit, like, you know, they have a laundry list of sponsors on their website or something. Um, it just doesn't do it for us and we want you know, it's better to work with like three or four sponsors tops. Or, like, you know, obviously maybe more if your event scales up, but work really closely with a few sponsors and, you know, develop a, lo a much longer term relationship than it is to just grab like, you know, 50 different sponsors for one and then just give them in like, you know, not work with all of them as intimately as you do with three or four. And of course it all, it depends, you know, it varies sponsor to spon uh, varies event to event, player to player, but that's kind of the general rule. I think people should maybe consider um, from now on, when you approach a sponsor, don't just think you're going to get, even if you're getting like a couple keyboards, or a couple mice, and you know, you're looking for monetary or something, like, you know, just be aware that just giving stuff out to some people is, is quite a bit for us. So, um, you know, just do your best to think long term and uh, work closely with the people you talk with on Skype. Okay. Uh, that brings So we can yeah. sum that up in one word total impressions? <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, I try. I try to look beyond total impressions, but you know, the numbers make things a lot easier. But yeah, I mean, total impressions. Like, I mean, could to you me, tell us? T could you tell everybody what an impression is so that they know? Because I don't think many people. In oh, the okay, yeah. Are like an impression aware. is, and excuse me if I get this wrong, but like you know, impression is just like a hit for one on a website. The amount of viewers you get on your Twitch channel, the amount of viewers you get on your TL channel or on your TL forum, or any you know, just social any media. Kind of Social media, any kind of exposure that you can Likes possibly imagine. Yeah, man, like all, all that stuff, all the people, <laughs> all that really? stuff that people, uh, you know, make you <laughs> like them on Facebook, make you follow them on Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Like every single impression counts. So, yeah. So that's, uh, well, I mean, given that, that's obviously the most important thing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, is there any, yeah, can you see something that, that, can you see some project or something coming up to you that, you know, isn't it doesn't have very many viewers, yet they can still get your attention. Is there a scenario like that that you can envision? Yeah, but that's very, um, I would say, very specific because for me, I'm personally, um, I'm I'm personally like, I'm, oh sorry, I'm someone who you know grew up with StarCraft and played StarCraft, so I know a lot about StarCraft-based projects and StarCraft-oriented events. So I like to think that I like to know I can pick out like certain shows or certain events that I think will have a lot of potential in the long run. But um, in other games, when it comes down to it, like I just don't know enough about the community or I just don't know enough about um, the people working in it that I can't, you know, just take a risk on a really small project like that. It, for me, it personally, it just had, unfortunately has to come down to StarCraft. And it all, for me, it's always on a case-by-case case, case case basis anyway. 
But um, unless there's like a really, really good idea behind it and they can show me they have like good projections for good numbers, then um, it's really unlikely that we take risks on really, really small projects or like invest a lot in a lot of small projects. Like we'll sponsor a very small event from time to time, but we're not going to take a huge risk on it, like, you know, dump all our money into it or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people out here are, you know, a lot of people in the community have a, you know, there's a lot of good ideas out there. And a, lot, a lot of people are trying to, you know, trying to make content, right? And and they're trying to figure out how to get sponsors or they already have, you know, some type of content or event or, and they just don't have any sponsors. Um, and I think you, you kind of hinted at it earlier, but what is the proper way for people to approach a sponsor? Like, what, would you, what uh, advice would you give these people? I mean, obviously, the email, <laughs> this is like, no one likes to hear this, but emailing, Personally, me emailing me is the best way, just because I have an archive of it, and I just go through. I go down the list and make sure I contact everyone back. Dude, but that's, uh, that's e that's email that's them, that's try to catch them on Skype, right. kind of try to catch them on Twitter, and then when you get their attention, like send them a a really decent marketing deck, or like a website or something with all the information they could possibly ever need. And I think the marketing deck is, you know, probably the best thing to send your sponsor. And if you don't know what it is, you should. Well, I'll explain it to you. Marketing deck essentially is. Um, you know, it's like a PowerPoint or a PDF file that just has really fancy slides on the number of impressions you guys get, the results your players get. Uh, you I've know, got one you can show on stream, Chris. Let me see okay. if I can find it. Sure. Yeah. And it just shows uh, a ton of all the information you ever need. And a really good example of this uh, that I got was from actually Lone Star Class. That's the one I'm about to send him. Oh, yeah, dude. Let me, I, I should just use those guys as a case study because they were a very small event. Um, I knew I knew the Tesla guys. I knew what they did, and I knew they were a really nice local community. But you know, they were asking you know for quite a bit of a sponsorship, you know, to do Lone Star Clash, and you know, we had to calculate, or we, you know, we had to think about what kind of risk we were going to take on these guys. And obviously, their marketing deck swayed us a lot. You know, they showed all the information, they showed the projections, they showed the projected viewers, and you know, knowing a bit about the players, I'm like, yeah, you know, these numbers seem right. They're going to get this many viewers. And uh, you know, we gave them sponsorship. It was pretty substantial, and it was probably the best thing we ever sponsored in North America, to be that quite honest. That was still very much a risk for you guys, though, too, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, because, uh, you know, it was even a risk for CSN to get involved because here was a group of, uh, of, of students, basically, that, that uh, you know, you just had to kind of put your trust into. But it was things mm -hmm. like that, like what you're saying, uh, that made it more professional. That, that gave they were extremely that, professional. Like, anytime. I just got Go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Like they were just extremely professional um, in every sense of the word. Like they had the people followed up with me all the time. They kept trying to like increase the package. Like, okay, you know, we can give you this on top of this on top of this. Like, we'll do this exposure. We'll give you like, the banners all over the place. You know, we'll put you on stream. They even showed me like some graphics beforehand. Like they were just really making sure that I was comfortable with doing the sponsorship. And even at the event, they were constantly thanking me, constantly showing me around how they were working on sponsorship. I mean. They were really taking care of us um, with their sponsorship package, and that's just, I feel everyone should just follow that Lone Star model, man. Like, they were just so great with uh, handling their sponsorship. Yeah, let me save this. Put it up on screen. Yeah, I'm saving this right now. I, just, I have All it right, on my so web browser. But it's just anytime you invest in anything, it's a risk. There's no such thing as a yeah, risk-free yeah, yeah. investment. It's, it's, it's impossible to do such a thing unless you're talking about putting your money in a 1.5% savings account or something. But uh, when you get something especially in this community, when you get something that looks like what the Rosens put together, th this is about as risk-free as it gets. You can see the work that they've done. And anytime, anytime, in esports especially, somebody does this kind of work, it's going to be, uh, on some level, a success. Uh, and this is what is lacking from all these teams out there that are seeking sponsors. Just no, oh, understanding, yeah, no understanding of how this works. So, all right, I'm, um, getting, I'm putting it up right now, guys. It's black screen right now, but here we go. This is what it looks like, guys. This is a this is a PDF file that is uh, this basically this proposal, right, that you received, and it looks like this. Uh, yeah, it's one of three that I got. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they had three. It was great. They had this. They had an executive document write up, which just gave us like a rundown of the logistics of the yeah, event. I can send that one too. And then four, they actually gave you a dollar by dollar breakdown. Like, say you sponsor us for, you know, X amount of dollars, you're gonna get the title sponsorship. This is the TT Esports Lone Star Clash. Oh, nice. Basically, we buy their event. And then number two, you know, it's a bit lower, but we're still all over the place. You know, number four is a bit lower, even more, but we still get the exposure on stream, that kind of stuff. So they did an absolutely great job. I mean, guys, look at you can see on the Twitch channel right now. It just looks absolutely stellar. 
So uh, yeah. graphics artists looking to break into esports, man. We need more of these guys. Yeah, yeah you're exactly right. I would exactly. hire either one of these Rosens or any number of the guys that worked on this instantly. This is absolutely, this is absolutely, really good work. Yeah, this is I'm not sure very nice. Yeah. Wow, this is yeah. <laughs> impressive. On those pictures, and, and did it for us too, man. Like my boss, you know, I I wasn't the one handing out the money, but my boss saw those pictures and he's like, you know. We got to do this, you know. Take my money. Shut up and take my money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> please, please. No, you'd be, um, I mean, you'd be surprised as a graphic designer. You'd be surprised how much pictures can, can, can make yeah. a difference. It, it just, it just like shows that. work ethic. It shows passion. Yeah. It shows caring. It's like you send me a shitty little spreadsheet that says this is what I want and this is what you get. And it's like okay, um, I'll get back to you. But uh, I mean, like I talked to the Rosens afterwards, the Lone Star event, and we talked about. Um, you know, I held a similar, not not a really big tournament, but uh, speaking as like a community member, you know, we did a big, pretty big CSL tournament in Irvine. You know, it didn't get as like a millions of hits, but it was still took a lot of time to put together. It was like the biggest project we ever done. Uh, we had it stream like early production, and we were just talking about the amount of time it took. You know, I was going back to Ben's point from last week. All this stuff is starting to take up, is starting to become a full-time job. You know, for the Rosens, they said they were spending 14 hours a day oh, getting the logistics together, getting the sponsorships together, you know, missing class. You know, what's school when it comes to a production like this? It's It really takes a lot of your time, you know, for better or for worse, but they had the passion, and to Ben's point, they had the competency, you know. They knew how to work sponsors. They knew how to work players. Mm -hmm. It was just a great experience all around, and I mean, I can go on and on about Star Clash, but it was just awesome. But to answer your question directly, Chris, when, mm -hmm. when, you, when you ask, okay, how do you approach a sponsor? That's how you approach a sponsor. You approach a sponsor with numbers. Oops. Uh, we, you approach a sponsor with numbers and with impressions and with uh, evidence that you're doing the legwork and that you're busting your ass and that you understand how to reach out to people. Um, I don't know. Make them fall in love with your event. God exactly. Yeah. You, know, you make yeah. them want to be a part of it. And uh, you don't just say, this is what I have. What can you give me? It's yeah, all the bells and whistles with it. You have to just no you have holes. to prove that you're marketable or convince them that you're marketable. And my my yeah. God, I wanted to I wanted to pay the Rosens for letting me cast their event. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, you know, th and there are plenty of people in the community going back to being voluntary. Uh, you know, help. There are plenty of people in the community that are willing to do things like this because it looks good. You know, if I was a graphic designer just getting started, and somebody, you know. It reached out and said, "Hey, I need a marketing deck put together." I'd be all about it, you know, uh, initially because it, it's a good opportunity for me to get my name out there as well. Yeah. But, but absolutely, there are people that are willing to do that, you know, and help. And, and it'd be nice, obviously, if we could pay everyone. But this is esports, so. Yeah, right. but you know, you do one good piece of uh, a piece of good work for someone, and they'll recommend you all over the place. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. All right. Well, I think that was really beneficial. Hopefully, you guys out there, you know, well, have learned a few things from that. I think it could be very, very helpful to the viewers. So, okay, why don't we move on to the next topic, which is, Tim, what are your views, or everybody really, what are your views on sponsoring individual players versus teams? And obviously, TT Esports is is sponsoring White Raw, so you guys, you know, are really good. You're a really good person to discuss this with. Yeah, well, you know, actually, um, I work in the USA branch in Taiwan. Our main headquarters handled that sponsorship. Okay. But um, I can just tell you a bit about White Raw, my interaction with him. So anytime he's in the USA, I'm kind of his manager or, you know, his assistant. And, you know, I just run around, get what he needs, make sure he's doing okay. But um, sponsoring someone like White Raw, he's certainly, like, an anomaly in, in the fact that, you know, he's a sponsored individual player. But also in the fact he's not only the nicest guy in the world, but he knows how to handle a sponsorship. He knows how to be marketable. He knows how to work his social media, all that kind of stuff. Like after IPL4, um, he was around Irvine, and that's where I live currently. And you know, he was like, "Hey, you know, let's go out, let's hang out for the day. You know, I don't have things to do for two days." And during the entire time he was out, he was talking about new upcoming promotions, where he's going to be the next two days, how we can put it on Facebook, Twitter, our website, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, we had a good time, we'd hang out, we, we got crab, we tweeted about the crab and stuff, but this guy is just all about the fans, he's all about the marketability, he's all about just being, a, you know, he's about building his brand as well, so we even did a little mini fan meetup and he tweeted all those pictures and those got really great response, like he really knows how to work it and, I mean, the guy is just an amazing person to work with, he's even, his knowledge is probably even beyond me, I mean, of course it's beyond me, he's been working in a, a lot longer than I have. 
But White Raw is just the really prime example next to like Lone Star of what you should really do as a sponsored player. The one downside, though, which he does admit, is uh, when we go back to results, you know, of, of course it's a bit lacking, but it's because this guy's traveling everywhere to do promotions and stuff. And he really, he even talked to me about it. He wants to really sit down and grind out a couple of games and just get better at the game. You know, he really is still a really competitive player. And it's just unfortunate. He has all these promotions he has to do, and sometimes it doesn't give him practice time. Nah, it's not. It's not even important. White Rose yeah. doing great things for esports. He's, he's, mm-hmm. he's grown beyond being a player. He's a, he's a bit of a figure. And uh, yeah. sure, it's unfortunate that we're not going to see him getting the kind of results that he's maybe capable of. Uh, at least in the near future, he's still doing some really good things. Uh, I have mm-hmm. mad respect for. I mean, Alexi. if. if if I may jump in with a little anecdote, so at Lone Star Clash again, you know, White Rod did a signing at our TT Sports booth, and you know, he the line was out the door, you mm-hmm. know, the entrance way, and then all the sponsors took note, and they, you know, they approached them, of course, and I'm not one to say he's his own man, but you know, uh, a sponsor went up to him, and then you know, he sat down with the sponsor, he showed them his social media, he showed him his reach, he showed him his website, he, you know, he basically <sighs> gave him a breakdown like on the spot. I mean, I was so impressed with what he was doing. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that's much worked out. I think he's still maybe may or not be in the talks. But, uh, like I said, the guy is just amazing at what he does. He's a businessman. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, man, he's so good. So good. He's also so fun to party with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The guy, he, he knows how to work people, man. He's great. One yeah. time he walked up to me and said, you want to try Ukrainian fish? And I was like, what? And he's like, yes, you drink with beer. And I was like, you drink fish? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I I like, okay, fish. I'll try it. I'll, I'll give it a try, and he goes, he goes, okay, and he pulls a fish out of his pocket, and he's like, this is Ukrainian fish, special fish, and uh, and I tried his fish, and it was, <laughs> it was like an it old smelled, sock. <laughs> it smelled awful. It really did. It smelled it. It smelled kind of like pounded ass, but oh, uh, but it was delicious. Believe it or not, the first time I actually met him was back in Brood War. He was obviously a pretty po- prominent Brood War figure. We went to IEF in Korea, and it was the first time I ever met him. And believe it or not, his English was actually worse than it is now. But uh, <laughs> the only thing he could really, like, we could really understand was, like, he wanted to drink with us. And he, like, wa- <laughs> you know, him and the Ukrainians walked up to us. They're like, you, you want drink? And he has this giant bottle of vodka in a hotel lobby, the first time I ever met him. And just right there, we just start doing shots together. It was pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing about White Rod is he, he's looked the exact same way for like the past <laughs> decades. Like if you look His up White Rod pictures from yeah. 1980, he looks exactly the same as he looks today. He doesn't age, man. He's ageless. Yeah. Um, he's an ageless wonder, man. <laughs> once you reach max level, you stop. Well, <laughs> 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 uh, I got a really awesome. another great anecdote about White Rod. Just, uh, to, just to prove again, this guy's almost a genius. Like, Remember a long, you know, like way back in the beta when State of the Game was still going on with you know just a really low key thing, and you know Jeff was on it. He was telling uh, you know machine running about this, but Jeff was talking about an experience he had with White Raw, and that's where the special tactics thing came from. You know White Raw never used to say special tactics before, and it just came out of Jeff's mouth and it kind of snowball. Then White Raw just took it and he ran with it, and now they're on T-shirts. People are asking <laughs> to sign it. I mean it's insane, and he saw like the potential of that. And if you guys remember in NASL season one, he goes on to the you know on the stage with the song, and the song is the Barbara Streisand Special Tactics remix, and the crowd goes crazy. Like he knows exactly what he's doing in the community. It's it's absolutely insane. Yeah, there you go. I can keep going, but. I'm <laughs> just well, I mean, it sounds like well, I mean, there's no doubt White Raw is <laughs> probably one of the, you know, the best guys in in all regards, like in our in our figure. And I think I agree with you too. I think he's he's pretty much the icon. He and probably Day are probably the icons in this, you know, in our yeah. young community. Yeah, and um, just, Chris, just to make it full circle, to answer your original question, how do you approach a sponsor? And the, the answer mm-hmm. is prove that you're marketable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what White Rod did. That's what these uh, Lone Star guys did. Uh, that's what people like Day9 do brilliantly. Husky, anybody that's successful in esports, they've made themselves marketable. Bryce has taken off because he likes to eat stupid shit. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hey. but that's you know that's marketability. Yeah. And and Bryce, by the way, Kevin really wants to challenge you to an eating contest. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, I noticed he like tweeted me for uh, what did we want to do? He wanted to do like some burger challenge. Oh, hot wings, hot wings. Yeah. Right. That sounds yeah. like an event to me, man. Yeah. We gotta get, get that on stream. <laughs> 
we should do it. Yeah. Do it while we'll playing. It do it while playing. While Paragraph. playing. <laughs> the same like, time. Oh god. oh god, it's like like, box, it's like hot chess boxing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, if you retire your keyboard. Pause. Pause. I got. I got uh, hot wing sauce all over my keyboard. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh man, that's awesome. All right, I think the last thing we were going to discuss is kind of a lead, you know, kind of a, a follow up to the last thing about whether sponsored players or not. And I think you kind of answered it just because you you think white raw is a, an anomaly. But um, one thing I wanted to mention is you know bling bling is actually receiving somewhat of a I mean he's receiving a uh, individual sponsorship from Total Biscuit as well as being on the team too, yeah, right? Yeah. So um. So it sounds like you know this sponsoring an individual player is you know slowly, slowly kind of you know starting to kind of creep into our industry, and um, it kind of makes sense to me because I, I I've always kind of felt like the StarCraft II, uh, the makeup of it was more like something like golf or tennis, where where I feel like you know the players are sponsored, they have management teams, but there's no team kind of concept to it, right? And I guess my question to all of you guys is, do you think the team structure is going to be there in the future? Or is it going to turn into more of an individual thing? Not team. Uh, I think it team because it seems, it doesn't seem more risky to put all of your funds into one single player, yeah. whereas like, you know, with a uh, team you're just distributing that between more people, you have more potential. You're like, let's say White Raw just starts going on a, a slump and eventually just, you know, for whatever reason doesn't end up winning anything ever again. You're still, you know, he's still very marketable, but you, in the end, want to see those results. Whereas if you're sponsoring a, a major team like an EG or a Slayers or, uh, you know, you're almost, I wouldn't say uh, you're guaranteed to see those results, but you have a, a lot more potential to do so. Yeah, yeah I agree, Bryce. Uh, there's a place for both. We have to remember TLO and and Tyler or Noni. They were sponsored for the first MLG cycle. Um, I think I don't know if either of them still are. Um, but yeah. But um, but like like Bryce was saying, uh, like the the guys that are going to take these individual deals are the guys that have huge <laughs> inherent value in themselves. At the time that Tyler and TLO got those sponsorships, they were the most well, a couple of the most talked about players in the scene. Uh, in Control's a guy that's very marketable. Uh, mm -hmm. Grubby's a guy that's very marketable. Um, players like this, with this huge natural following and, and with the ability to articulate the business side of esports, they'll get picked up for things like that. But at the same time, people still want to be the guys that are like, hey, I'm Liquid's primary sponsor. That's, a huge, that's, that's, that's really big. The amount of... I mean, Liquid sells stuff you know yeah. they they sell it and they do very well with it uh and so i mean the, as long as a team is is uh is creating buzz then then there's going to be people that want to pay for them and to that point about about the uh the team structure so again going back to the princeton symposium i, I suggest people actually check out the princeton esports symposium vod because alex garfield and, and uh hot bid Ken Chen from Team Liquid, they talked a lot about uh, marketing the team, how they run their team, all that, and how they view the future of esports. It's really educational, actually. But um, what I think what Pop did and both Alex Garfield said is when you sponsor a team, you're not sponsoring just the players, but you're sponsoring the brand that's going to last you know, longer than how, how long a player is because you know, the volatility of the scene is still there. You know, one guy may be dom super dominant for like six months, and then he's slumping, you know, for the next six months. And the only thing that really backs him up is that team rep, you know, the team liquid rep or the EG rep. And that's, as a sponsor, to me, that's kind of tricky when I pick up up-and-coming teams um, is because, you know, what why, teams besides... Why is it tricky? Huh? Oh, because it's like, uh, you know, personally for me, what teams besides EG and TL have really <laughs> proved that year, you know, those years and years and years of you know, marketability and that sustainability and that branding. And then to me, it's just a, it's a matter of working with them closely, making sure they're making, uh, treating our brand right, treating their brand right, and marketing themselves. But again, I'm still learning, I'll admit I'm still learning. Um, but those are just like, you know, the shallow, very shallow first impression kind of things. But in other words, if a team can prove to you that it's producing, <laughs> then... Yeah, if results are there, we're, we're going to go for it pretty much. Okay, yep. great. Uh, why don't we... We've still got quite a bit of time here, so I think uh, this, this last segment that we, we like to do on this show is um, it's called brainstorming. And what I wanted to do here is kind of ask 
particularly the two guests and you know all of us included, uh, what are some of the things that you wish would happen in the industry right now? And you know, we're not talking we're talking realistic things. We're not talking about oh, I wish that an event would you know have a prize pool of a billion dollars. You know, <laughs> like something that's actually you know realistic and you think could uh, you know could potentially be be uh, fixed or or um, you know just be better. I want foreign teams to be more serious about their players. <laughs> uh, I think the, the the instant you have a foreign a group of foreigners that are producing consistent results, uh, viewership for tournaments skyrockets. Uh, sponsors become more interested. I mean, it, the Koreans are awesome and they're great players. But you're lying to yourself if you think um, an American doesn't want to see an American do well, <laughs> or a Swede doesn't want a Swede do well. Look at DreamHack. How crazy was that that crowd for oh. Thorazine? Uh, that that's that is marketability. If you want to grow esports, you have to you have to increase the value of the players, and uh, and to do that, the players have to be producing, and to do that, the teams have to be working them. It's just how it is. FXO tried; they fired all their foreigners, and now they're working in Korea. Well, in the in Asia, where uh, where it's easier to make people work. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good. It's a better position than ever because the infrastructure's there. We just need the results from the foreigners. Yes. Well, what do you guys yeah. think of? I mean, I completely agree with you, Ben. That it's like uh, you know, I want to see a, an American win. You know, that's just you know that's just how it is. And I always kind of look back at the first you know season of the Starcraft, uh, the first MLG season with Starcraft Two, back when I think what Huck won. Uh, Huck, Greg, or Chris, Greg. Uh, was it Kiwi that won a few? Or no, I think won Huck won again after that, right? Did he? Yeah, Huck won two, Naniwa won one, Jinro won one. Jinro, okay. But I, I remember back in the first scene when Huck won, and, you know, there weren't any Koreans at these tournaments, right? But I remember right. watching it and thinking, like, I remember just being just as satisfied, like, that feeling I have was just as satisfying watching him win in a, you know, basically North American-only kind of tournament, uh, as it is, you know, watching DRG win, like the MLG Arena. And yeah. I guess my, the point I'm trying to make is, what do you guys think of a North American-only, like, event? I mean, or just... No, North Americans are too bad. It would be boring. <laughs> well, it's not going to fly anymore because we're spoiled, like, bottom line. Yeah, yeah but do you, think, do you think we've gone too far with that? I mean, yes. I, I just... It doesn't even matter. It's over. I think yeah, at this point we've hurt, we're hurting the ourselves. Tournaments can decide that. Yeah, I agree with you. I know where you're going with this, better, and I, I agree with with everything you're going to say. I hope. Go for it. No, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, it's we don't want to get we don't get schooled by Ben. It's scary. It gets just it just gets so stale when you know you know the outcome of a tournament in the round of eight, and oh, you know, none people. of the guys that you're cheering for. It's always the same people. Why? Yeah, it's a regurgitation of the same thing over and over again. And this arena, I mean, there was a huge thing on Team Liquid about it. And it's a, a guy from uh, Kadrid had made an article about, you know, how a glowing article about how great the arena was. And a lot of people chimed in that the DreamHack was better. And one of the main reasons why they felt that it was better was not, and they admitted, I mean, on paper, the arena had, you know, huge amounts of skill, you know, leaps and bounds probably more than what DreamHack had. But it was something about rooting for someone that, that you didn't think possibly would have a chance. Yeah, Thorzane has had no results for so long. I mean, he's always a really good player, but I was writing him off as being second, third best U European Terran. And he comes out and he does this in, and in his home country, in yeah. front of Swedish fans. It was a really magical moment, man. And that is what people want to tune in for. People don't want to tune in to see... Uh, I mean, it's fun watching Dongregu and Marine King go at it. That's a, that's a really cool rivalry that's developing. But it's not the same as, as, you know, the underdog story. Yeah, I mean, I lost. I, I love what IPL does, and it was, it was, you know, this last IPL was a little disappointing for me because towards the end it was like, what was there? Actually, all of them were Koreans in the final 16 or 14. No, or eight, no, 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 eight, no, no, no. It eight, was, so. it was, it was actually really cool because uh, the top half had a had a red possibility. The bottom half had. Uh, Thorzane possibility, and also on the bottom half was Nurcio, who barely lost to Monster. Oh, he's talking yeah. about IPL, right? You, you were talking yeah, about, IPL. Talking oh, about oh, IPL. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm talking yeah. about the IPL. You know, when you got towards the end, it was like, yeah, top eight, just, top eight were I think Koreans because Stefano got, I think, I knocked out in the quarters there. Yeah, um, I think is Chris the and, highest foreigner, and he didn't even make it to the championship. Right. Oh, right. I mean, and listen, yeah, if you are a true hardcore StarCraft fan and you love watching the games. 
uh, those games are going to be great for you. Uh, and I watch a lot of StarCraft, but as I've said before, you know, I'm still understanding it. For So for me, I'm kind of like the perfect demographic that needs to be reached because I'm the kind of guy that, that I want to watch for more than just the game itself. Um, yes, the game is important, obviously. Storyline is what's important. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, I need a storyline. I need something yeah. to, for you to interest me, and and at the at, and and for the arena, I love Violet. Everyone knows I love Violet, you know. And and, and uh, for me, there's a storyline with him, but I've seen this before, you know. And, and so the arena didn't quite interest me as much. It doesn't matter how great the production value was; there was just no storyline there. Yeah, and then to take it one step further, it's also very frustrating for the players. Uh, it, Bryce, how do you feel when you come into an open bracket and see four Koreans in your way? Yeah, I mean, oh, obviously, uh, it's a pretty daunting task. Uh, it's, yeah. it's fucking depressing, man. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, I mean, and I'm glad that Koreans are coming and playing in foreign events. It's great, but is the mentality amongst <laughs> pros not Jesus Christ? These guys are pillaging our tournaments. Exactly. Uh, no, not at all. Like you know, you take IPL for example. I beat Tyler, who's you know. I mean, he doesn't have the greatest results, but not a terrible player. And then Demaga, but then I fall to Rian. No one hears about my results, you know. I didn't even make it through a championship bracket. But Any other tournament, like a European tournament, beating a Demaga would be a, a pretty it's big a deal. It's a huge just, deal, and that's yeah. one of the things that's so cool about the Euro scene, <laughs> because it's so There's hard to play on Europe from Korea. You get a yep. very, uh, I'm going to use the word, pure tournament where you know you really get to see these foreigners duking it out amongst each other and european fans are so passionate about the guys that are from their countries uh one time i misspoke and said that feast was from i think romania because the <laughs> belgian yes. flag oh. like, no dude oh, i had like 15 oh, my million God. from belgium like, no he's ours <laughs> you know and, and these are just you know these fans love it and and when you have a feast versus a, a supernova at an iam all of belgium is watching for that and he wins and people just go apeshit crazy. Uh, and then, you know, he turns around and gets beaten by MMA and minus 5,000 guys on the stream just like that. Um, I, you know, well, it's, like, uh, there's nothing wrong with Koreans playing in these tournaments. I don't want to be that guy that's, like, hating on Koreans. Um, but it, it definitely hurts uh, the marketability of these tournaments. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about growing StarCraft 2 here. Okay, like, you know, it's already big in Korea. You know what I mean? And, and the... Like, the only way we can grow it here is to, you know, have our own champions and, and that we can, you know, that actually has some kind of success. And that's why I was trying to get at just, yeah, we are spoiled. We brought, we brought over the Koreans, you know, the last year and a half now. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of people are spoiled. The people that watch DSL are going to, you know, want to watch MLGs with the DRGs and MKPs and everything. But there are quite a few people and new viewers, I think, that would enjoy just even, like, let's, let's talk about the Blizzard, right? The, the, the Blizzard, uh, North, you know, North American qualifiers, right? And, yeah. and, and they're, trying to, they're actually trying to regionalize these things, right? And kind of bring back that WCG kind of feel. I, I feel like that's what they're trying to do. Um, let's talk about that. I mean, that's a good thing, right? Uh, it's an okay thing. Like, it's cool, but I, I get the feeling that nobody's going to watch. Like, North American top four, it's going to be Idra, Sheth, but you never know. I mean, no, I know because there's just so much separation between these these guys at the top. Um, there's there's eight players in North America that are miles better than everybody else, and uh, it's it'll be I think it'll be a little bit more interesting when you get to like continental finals, like like the Europe final is going to be really cool. The North America final where we get uh, you know maybe I don't know if Kiwi even plays it, or <laughs> Kiwi and Huck against you know Idra and Sheth. That kind of stuff's kind of cool, but I don't know. But we're, I mean, we're talking about problem solving here, right? So what well, should we the, do? The way you what solve the do? problem is you get your players better. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. Your players have to be competitive, and if they're not competitive, then you're wasting your time. It is nice, but like even if you think back to the first few MLGs, the ones like a Chris one or Greg one, you know, in the back of everyone's mind, and everyone was saying, you know, well, it's not the GSL, you know, the Koreans are in it. So it's nice to be able to have these MLGs with the Koreans in it, just to it legitimizes it. wins. Yes, exactly. It gives them legitimate wins, but then at the same time, the foreigners like, you know, they're they're doing well. Like Chris has won, uh, you know, the, the Orlando last year and things, but for the most part, the Koreans are just kind of dominating the scene right now. Uh, it's odd. I just got a Skype message from a Korean American, and it makes me think of something. I think I brought it up last time. I wi I, I just hope that at some point and very soon, that we can get away from it being about 
Koreans, Americans, and North Americans. Uh, you know, I mean, and Europeans, you know. I mean, I wish... Just a uh, happy-go-lucky, we're all humans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, you know, okay. and, and <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's not really. I it's, just, it's, you know, it just it's always about Koreans and and then everyone else. And it, I don't know. And it's it going to stay it, that way until everybody's yeah. competitive, John. It's just, it, you're you're wasting your breath, man. And that may be true. I just, I just, it, it, it's frustrating at times, I guess. It frustrates I mean, me that these fucking teams go out and try to seek sponsors before they develop their players. But right. But what do you call Violet? Let's say Violet ends up living in the United States and he ends up getting a, a U.S. citizenship. What, uh, what do you call Select? I mean, I don't know. I mean, Violet, I mean, he's, he's definitely made this sort of a switch, and it's endeared him to me. Uh, but I would still much rather see... Uh, I, w I won't even say much rather. I really like Violet a lot. Like personally, I know him and I feel like he's a friend and I like him a lot. So that's difficult. But um, y you know, if if Dong Regu moved to America, uh, I would still definitely cheer more for a Damaga. Yeah, I think I just, just because I, feel, I, I, I maybe I'm a, maybe my opinion sucks because I know these guys so well. I mean. Yeah, most back. most of the good Europeans and a lot of the good North Americans, you know, I've had drinks with, I've had good conversations with, and I feel, you know, a connection to. Whereas, and, and this is maybe my fault for not really caring as much about the Korean scene, but I just, I, I really want to see foreigners okay. reaching that next level okay. and taking that next step. And yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, for you, for you, it's it's more about um, their nationality, not so much the race and things like that. I mean, and that I guess that's. That it, it's sometimes that line gets blurred, but I agree with you. I mean, it really. I, I love Violet to death, you know. And and if he was if he was here in the United States and this became his home, I could understand that. But there's something about rooting for a machine to upset him that is in the back of my head. I mean, it would be awesome. I, I mean, I have to admit that I think it'd be great. I'd love to have those two in the rundown and meet in the final, and, and machine ends up winning like you know three games or something. That would be fucking awesome, awesome man. Yeah. I, I would love to see machine upset. A top-level Korean in a final. That would just—it would be another really magical moment, like Thorazane versus Polt. I swear to God, I thought Polt was going to stomp the hell out of Thorazane, and uh, seeing that was just awesome. Um, the, those kind of moments build what yeah. we're doing here. And when you know, when the casual fan tunes in to see Huck making a run through and then getting knocked out by a Korean, it really, it, to me, it feels. It just feels uh, like you're cheating them a little bit. It's like, okay, well, here's my guy, my hometown hero that I'm really cheering for, and now he's gone. Yep. To, Yep. And um, you know, I I mean I agree with you, Ben. I think I think all the players need to step it up and get there. But that that is such. I mean, we're talking like huge, huge steps. So I'm I'm even just trying to think about little. They're not steps. huge steps, man. You've, they've got foreigners everywhere that are taking games off Koreans. It's yeah, taking sure. eight series off Koreans in a row. That's difficult. Right. So I mean, they're, getting they're to small that point. steps. They're baby steps. Really. Uh, you're going to tell me that it's a big it's a it's a stretch to see Rhett winning an international tournament. He was top four at, at uh, DreamHack. It's it's not a stretch, but for me, it's like to grow that number of players that can even do that right now. I mean, how many players would you say right now, foreigners that can can do that right now? I mean, Rhett or Thorzane. I mean, Naniwa, Huck. Sasa, Huck, Naniwa, Thorazine, Stefano, Idre is capable of being so much more than he is right now. Uh, you've got young guys like Illusion. You've got Dignitas Killer down in Peru who's fucking good. And nobody knows who he is because yep. he's in Peru. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or, yeah. No, he's in Chile, I think. Chile. Uh, Chile's right. I think Chile's right, actually. Um, you know, you've got guys like Feast who have PVT that's as good as anybody in Korea. You've guys got guys like Grubby who's really close. You've got guys like Fnatic Todd and guys like Sin who's kind of straddling the line. Uh, but you know, he's got a huge fan base behind him. There, there are guys with the potential. They're, just, they're, they're not held to any sort of a standard, and that is the biggest problem in the foreign scene right now. And you and you keep going back and you keep going back to that bitter and um, and it's so true and I you know people are saying in the chat you can't just tell them to do that you can't just tell them damn right I can tell them to do that and, and that's, I, that's what I'm making that point that's what we're doing the show say, work your ass off you're gonna go home in a bus and right. that's <laughs> that's just how it is there's there's nobody that's being a boss yeah. everybody's just like oh, whatever play Starcraft have fun. Eat ice cream and cinnamon. No offense, machines. 
Oh, man. I'm taken. Uh, All right. I don't you know, do you think it's because everyone's so spread out it's hard to really, like, get the particular practice as opposed to, like, a Korean house like Slayers where they're able to have so many great players, like, inside one... It creates difficulty, yeah. I agree, but uh, but when you have players like Stefano who stand head and shoulders above the rest of the foreign scene with just ladder practice, uh, you have to say to yourself, well, okay, well, then there's obviously viability in, in the tools that we have. Uh, let's utilize these better. Well, I mean, uh, and what is he doing differently that others aren't? You know, he he does a lot of customs actually. He, yeah. he says he only plays ladder. I mean, he, he's a, he's a troller. I mean, he doesn't tell you a lot of the yeah. stuff that he does. But I mean, you know, my my thing about the team house, you know, versus not is, I mean, we're on the internet, guys. I mean, like we're talking on Skype. I mean, I, I feel like the the concept of a, I don't know, I think a virtual team. I guess you could say. Um, just or even just a you know just this group of players you know.